Just a little bit. All right, little Dale. Whose birthday is it? One of them boys back there? Oh, Smiley. Which one of them? Whichever one it is. I don't know all of them's name yet. Which one it is? All right, on the count of three, let's tell him happy birthday. One, two, three. Hey, <laughs> Amen. One of the young people back there. It's funny, when you're young, you're proud of them birthdays. When you're old, you're ashamed of them. Then when you get real old, you start being proud of them again. All right, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. One of the brothers asked that uh, do a study on this. And this is, is definitely one of our scriptures that we need to study here. Um, the hardest scripture to be understood if you're a Baptist in the whole Bible is Hebrews chapter 6. This is one of the great slaughterhouse uh, verses where the commentaries just go bonkers. There's at least five different beliefs about this scripture here. And as I said, if you're a Baptist, even eternal security, this scripture really, it's tough. It's tough to handle. That's why the chapter two before it says, strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. And what we're going to study tonight is strong meat. Strong meat. And let's take a little bit of time tonight. Uh, uh, ever since I've been preaching, we'll preach a while and people come in church a while and they'll do real good and they'll say, yeah, I believe that once you're saved by the grace of God, you know, you're always blown to the Lord. You're, you have eternal salvation. And about a month later, they come up, they've been reading their Bible and they say, what in the world does this mean? And I've done the same thing when I got saved, and probably you have too. What most Baptists do is just finally ignore it and say, well, I believe what I believe, and I can't understand it. Now, I believe the Lord wants us to go all through our whole life without knowing nothing. So let's tackle it tonight and start with verse 1. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms. We studied that the other night, the baptisms. And of laying on of hands. We've preached on that before in, in ordinations. And the resurrection of the dead. We studied that. And of eternal judgment. We studied that. And this will we do if God permit. All right, here we go. Verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance." seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. But beloved... We are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Now, the, the chapter brings up a controversial thought here as we study the Word of God. And of course, the thought is the matter of losing your salvation. And if in, when they did lose it, um, not being able to get it back and what a person had to do to lose it. And if you're a Baptist, of course, you don't believe you can lose it at all. So most of the denominations teach this is a person who was saved and doing right and then uh, falls away from the Lord, loses his salvation and goes to hell. But if you're a Baptist like we are and you're a Bible believer like we are and you believe in eternal security, uh, that presents all kinds of problems. 
So what I want to do tonight is I want to give you the five different approaches. You can read commentaries. I've got a bunch of commentaries at home. Sometimes I look to see what they say and sometimes I don't. And men treat these different things. I'm going to tell you what the Schofield says, people like Oliver B. Green. Uh, then, of course, there's... Uh, Author Dupink, Larkin, all of those men like that from a long time ago and then some of our modern day preachers about this scripture. There's one thing about it. Hebrews 6 has been a battleground for uh, Christians in our generation uh, like very few scriptures have. Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10. If you get Hebrews 6 figured out, you can get Hebrews 10 because it falls along the same line. Now, this is very, very... Um, when I first got saved... I, I went to, of course, Southern Baptist Church, and I just thought, well, I don't know nothing else, so this is what I feel like is right. Then I went through a stage when I'd been saved a few months where I started saying, well, hey, I'm not going to believe something's right just because I hear it here at church. I want to really get in the Word of God and find out for myself what I believe. Then I start reading these scriptures like this that seemed like they contradicted what I was being taught. So I sort of swung the other way and I thought, well, well, maybe, maybe, you know, maybe there is something to this other side of this doctrine. And then I, I said, well, what I'm going to do, I'm going to listen to what everybody says and then I'm going to get my Bible down and let God be true and every man a liar and find out what's right. And that's what I've tried to do all these years. I don't believe something just because a Baptist believes it. I don't want to believe it because the Bible teaches it, right? Something just because Brother Danny says it. That's preacher religion. You want to believe it because the Bible says it. A lot of pre, a lot of churches do real good as long as they've got a certain preacher. But if their preacher died, they wouldn't have a lick of religion, convictions, or nothing. You know why? Because they're not real. They're not real. They don't come from God. As soon as that preacher leaves, their beliefs go down with it wherever he went. You've got to get in this thing and get it for yourself and be established. And the Bible would develop a rugged individualism in your life that the world and the devil will not be able to shake. You can't be a clone. You can't say, well, Dr. So-and-so believes it, so I believe it. Uh, you know, maybe he's right, maybe he ain't right. I'll tell you what is right, what God said. All right, belief number one. Belief number one is that these were apostates. People who ultimately crossed the line, lose their salvation... And um, uh, are lost in this dispensation, the age of grace. Now, uh, the only way I can expose era is mention a few things. And I'm not trying to offend anybody or hurt anybody's feelings. If your mother is a Pentecostal or a Church of God or what well, that, they, they're some of the best people in the world. Fine people, love the Lord, free will Baptist. Um, every denomination except Baptist Presbyterian teaches that. And when you're saved, you go back and back into sin, and there is a point where you cross back over the line and become unsaved again. And every one of them have their own definition of where that point is. In other words, you got, I've heard one preacher say, I've heard one preacher say, if you sin and then die before you ask forgiveness, that you're lost. Others have a different definition of it and say you have to just deliberately turn your back on God and go out into sin for uh, some reasonable amount of time and then die and then you're lost. But if you just happen to mess up and then you die, you're not lost. So I've, I've one thing I've noticed that the people who teach that, every single one of them has their own idea of what you have to do to become lost and how many times you have to do it. And so it, you, they erect their own eyes. Well, I think that if you do this and this and this, you're still saved. But if you do that, you're not saved. You know what I'm talking about. You understand what I'm saying? It's like a lady told me, I've used this illustration umpteen times. A lady says, well, what if you go out here and get drunk and then you die? And I say, well, what if you go out here and gossip and then you die? See? Uh, both of them's a sin, Right? Now what they're saying is, this sin right here will make you go to hell, but this sin right here, it won't make you go to hell because that's the one I do. <laughs> and it's always the other man's sin that's going to send him to hell, right? Not my sin, not what I do. Now I know I do a few things wrong, but we all make mistakes. You ever heard that? We all make mistakes. No, that ain't what the Bible You sin. You sin. Quit lying. Ain't no mistake to it. You sin. You sin. 
flat out sin. You say, well, I didn't sin willfully. Every sin that you do consciously is willful. Now, if you've done something unconsciously and didn't know it, you might consider that not willful. But everything that you do that you know is wrong and you do it on purpose is a willful sin. And they just ain't no, no two ways about it. So this first definition is these are people in our dispensation who get saved, do real good for a while, live up to the church standards, then they go back into their old life, cross over the line. In other words, a child of God becomes an unchild of God. Um, the, our preacher Harlefield used to tell us at Nebo, he said, you can't unborn a Christian any more than you can unhatch a chicken. Once it's out of that egg, it's out from then on. It may be a good chicken, it may be a bad chicken, but it'll never unhatch and go back in that egg. And that's the way a Christian is. You're hatched, brother. When you're born again, you're hatched. You may make a mess, you may make a big splash, you may do great, but you're not going to go backwards and be unborn. You're born again. And you're never, you're never going to die. You have eternal life. Um, now I can show you one problem with this belief. One problem with this belief. And that is, verse 6, if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance. What does that say? That's right. If a person does get lost, they can't get saved again. And yet, always pray for people. Every time you hear one of them things, I tell you, pray. Because it might be somebody you know or somebody needs help. And did you know something? When you, when you get lost here, if, if that's what this is, which it ain't, but that's what they say it is, you can't get saved again. And yet, every one of those denominations teach that you can come back and get saved again, Right? I don't know one denomination that teaches you get one crack at it and get saved, but if you ever get lost, you can't get saved again. I don't know one. Free will Baptists teach that if you get lost, you can come back and repent and get saved again, right? Church of God teaches that if you get lost, you can come back and repent and get saved again. Lutheran Church, the Methodist Church, the uh, all Church of God, all Assembly of God, every seat that you cross the line and you're lost, but if you repent, you're saved again. That verse said it's impossible. It's impossible to renew them again under repentance once they fell away. So uh, um, if somebody tells you if you do this and that and this and that, you're lost, and they use Hebrews 6 to back it up, say, well, you can't get saved again. Uh, if you're lost every time you commit a sin, man, you, you're, you're lost more than you're saved. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. And the thing about it is, the Bible said if you know to do good and do it not, it's sin. Did you give a tract to everybody that you should have given a tract to today? Then you sin. you got sin in your life right now. If you died, you'd go to hell. They ain't none of us going to make it. They ain't none of us going to make it. If that's the way it is, you say, well, I don't believe it means that kind of sin. No sin will enter in. Somebody have her hand raised over Yeah. <laughs> Don't get too personal here, bro. <laughs> say that we believe you just give people a license to sin. And that's not true at all. You know, I don't know a Baptist preacher nowhere that says it's all right to go out and live like you want to. Sure does. Afraid they can't live it. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's true. A lot of people are afraid. They say, well, I tried it one time and I couldn't live it, so why try it again? And that discourages them. Nobody ever has lived it but the Lord Jesus Christ. We're saved by trusting in His life. God puts His life on. Well, anyway, I ain't got, I ain't got time to teach on eternal security tonight, but that's the first, first definition of this Scripture. Number two. All right, here we go. This is, uh, I, think, um, I think probably this is the Schofield 
definition. If you've got a Schofield Bible, this is the standard. If you go to some Baptist school, maybe like Tennessee Temple or Bob Jones or uh, uh, Fall Wells or, oh, I don't know, just about any fundamental, they call it, Baptist school, you'd be taught this. You'd be taught that these people in verse 4 and 5 and 6 are people who get right to the threshold of salvation, taste of it, turn around and walk away, that it's impossible to renew them again under repentance. Now, let me explain what I'm saying. They teach, and most bad, I'd say a lot, most preachers that come here and preach at our church probably believe this. They believe that this is people who come, maybe sit in a service, taste of the good Word of God, they feel it, they reach out and touch it a little bit and say, no thank you, I don't want that, I'm going away. It's impossible for them to be saved any other way because they rejected God's only plan and offer of salvation. Now that makes sense, that makes sense, but it's uh, real hard to, it's real hard to twist some of these scriptures into that doctrine. Uh, for example, in other words, they believe this is an external partaking of the things of God, not an internal partaking of the things of God. For example, uh, these Schofield, I believe, said these are like Jews who learn the truth and fall back into Judaism, and they take it. So what they're saying is you can taste the Word of God and be lost. Right? You can be a partaker of the Holy Ghost and be lost. Well, that's what they're saying. Ain't that what the Schofield is? That's <laughs> That you can... Uh, it's it's kind of like it's kind of like this. Say somebody had a, a glass of Coke right here. And they said, here, you want some of this preacher? And I tasted it. And I went... And spit it out. I didn't swallow it. Right? So, taste... And, and be a partaker of the Holy Ghost. And that's the one thing that bothers me about that teaching is that partaking of the Holy Ghost. I don't know if a lost person can partake of the Holy Ghost. Do you? Well, it's either a lost person or a saved person. If it's a saved person, they can fall away and get lost again. Well, I'm getting to that. <laughs> I'm getting to that. There you go. There you go. Man, you're on the ball tonight. I'm, that was going to be one of my next points. So, listen. If you, can, if you can taste the Word of God and not really believe it and be saved, Jesus tasted death but didn't really die. He did die. It said He tasted death for every man, so He actually died. So, tasting the Word of God means eat it. I mean, you know, it means it don't mean just lick it and smell of it and then turn around and walk off. So, the second definition... I, I'm, I'm trying. I, I don't expect everybody to understand all this. I'm going to try. Go over it one more time, then I've got three more. All right? These are people who come, they in service, uh, the Holy Spirit moves on them, they get a little bit of it. They say, man, I, I like that. That tasted good, but refuse it and walk out the door and, and are lost. It's impossible for them to renew them again and repent. But the only thing about it, bother, there's several things that bother me about that. This thing again, to renew them again under repentance. If they never repented to start with, how could you renew them again under something that they haven't never done? Pl Yeah, yeah, that's what they're saying. That's what they're saying. But, but let me get to this. They say it's that uh, Arthur W. Pink, Schofield, some of these folks teach that. Now, they were bright and shining lights in their day, and they were certainly great men, but that really don't fit all the context of the Scripture. The third definition. The third definition is given by Oliver B. Green and his commentaries. I have Oliver B. Green's commentaries. They're good commentaries. Uh, they don't, they're not King James all the way, but they got some real good illustrations and some stories in them. And, uh, this teaching is that it's hypothetical. It's purely conjecture and that this couldn't happen, but if it could happen, you couldn't be renewed again under repentance. In other words, it's just a, like a, 
like a, uh, we call that little word I'm trying to think of, uh, allegory. That's like a, like a parable, like if a Christian could fall away, they could never be renewed under it. Number four, and um, this some preachers that we know that have been here teach this, and this makes pretty good sense if you look at the context, is that this scripture represents a person to whom God, listen carefully, this scripture represents a person. This is what Dr. Tab teaches in his book. You might have been through this. This scripture represents a person who God will not grant permission to go on to perfection and will stand at the judgment seat of Christ with a loss of rewards and he'll have his life go up in smoke because he rebelled against the Lord and didn't want God's will for his life. So it would be impossible to renew him again and make him fulfill God's plan for his life. Dr. Tab said that... that um, if a, if a Christian, say like, say like me, for example, say like I quit preaching and I didn't want to do this. And I, I just said, I'm saved. I'll read my Bible every once in a while and go to church. And God said, all right, Danny, you better straighten up and do my will for your life. And I said, I don't want to. I'm not going to. That I would still be saved, but God wouldn't let me go on to perfection. Now, where it gets this is look at chapter 6. Look at chapter 6 and verse 1. The context is going on to perfection. And then verse 3 said, And this will we do if God permit. So God's not going to permit a person to go on affection that turns their back on the Lord Jesus Christ. See what he's saying? He's saying it's a saved individual who who refuses to live right and God won't let them go on to uh, perfection. And um, he puts the emphasis on the word it. For it... Going on to perfection is impossible. It, for that person to go on to perfection, is impossible. Uh, And he uses to prove this, verse 3, the writer of Hebrews says, We, Um, verse 1, verse 2, it says, We, talking about saved people, saved people, in this age, in the body of Christ. Right? So... It, in the context, means that you were enlightened, you were partakers of the Holy Ghost, you took of the Word of God, you are saved, but there's a problem with that interpretation. And the problem with that interpretation is, whoever that person is, they're going to be burned, verse 8. That's a problem. It don't say their works are going to be burned. It says they are going to be burned. Only your works are burned at the judgment seat of Christ. God's going to take your works, throw it into the fire, and it's going to be burned. Your works will be burned. And beloved, uh, that's, that's what that scripture said in verse number 8. Also, some other things saying that uh, renew them again under repentance. What does repentance mean in this scripture? Well, repentance means in verse 1, getting saved. See that repentance? I know there's repentance for a Christian and there's repentance for a sinner. This repentance is a sinner getting saved. You know how you know that? Verse 1 says, Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. That's what you do when you get saved. So if a person repents of their sins, that's the foundation of their salvation, putting their trust in Jesus Christ, turns to God, they are saved. And it says a person does that and then they fall away, it's impossible for them to ever do that again. And their end's going to be to burn. No, it says that which beareth the briars and the thorns. Whose end is to be burned. Whose? Like a pro, uh, ain't that a, I don't know if that's a pronoun or whatever. Who, like it's talking about a person, not that thorns and the briars are going to be burned. That who, whatever bear bore those thorns and briars are going to be burned. No. Uh-uh. No, I said there's two kinds of repentance. 
Uh, we repent all the time. If we do something wrong, we repent. But we're not repenting from dead works and laying the foundation and getting saved again. There's only one time that you get saved, and then after that you just repent daily whatever you do wrong. Oh. Sure, but you're not getting saved again. You're not repenting from, you're not laying the foundation again. All right, the next one. The next one, number five. And then we'll take your questions. The next one, number five, is that the book of Hebrews, doctrinally speaking, is written to who it says it's to, Hebrews. And this, there, doctrinally, there are Jews during the tribulation who have to endure to the end in order to be saved. And if they fall away and take the mark of the beast, then they're not there to be cursed and burned at the end. That's the only one that makes sense with the Scripture. That's the only one that you don't have to bend the Scripture a little bit to make it fit into what you're trying to make it teach. Now, the way I, when I listen to a man teach this, I watch him and I watch the verses that he brings out. And if I catch him bending a verse of Scripture to make it fit what he believes, I know his, his mind ain't thinking right. Just, you're not supposed to say, well, we Baptists believe this, and so this Scripture, I might have to push it a little bit to get it to fit in here. You just jump in there and say, whatever it says is right. And if it says you're going to be burned, it don't mean something else is. It means what it says. It says it's impossible for those written to Hebrews now, written to Hebrews. And remember all those scriptures that I've given you before. Uh, look at verse number, look at verse number 11. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. Under the end. That's the end of the tribulation. That's not the end of your life. We've showed you that from the other, other verses of, of Scripture. I ain't got time to do a big long thing on that, but it's like Jewish believers and converts who ever saved during the tribulation, who must endure to the end, and these, if they fall away, receive the mark of the beast, can never, ever get right in doctrinally you, it is past the church age. That don't mean I can't take this and preach it to you and inspire you to do right. That means doctrinally, doctrinally, we're going on past the church age into the millennium. Let me show you something. Let me show you something. Look at verse number uh, 5. And have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. See what that is? The powers of the world to come? What's that? The millennium that comes right after the tribulation. You see that? They're tasting of that world that's coming. And if they taste that and are made partakers of it. See, people in the tribulation ain't in the body of Christ. Why? Because the body of Christ leaves at the rapture. They're what we call tribulation saints. The body of Christ leaves at the rapture and the Holy Ghost is gone. Then the people who are saved during the tribulation are not in the body of Christ. That's why the parable said, go ye out in the highways and hedges, compel them to come in. And the parable said, wedding, bride and bridegroom, was furnished with what? Guests. They are guests at the wedding. They are not part of the bride. The bride, every bit of the bride of Christ goes home at the rapture. Now, if, if you believe, if you believe that the people that are saved during the tribulation are part of the bride of Christ, you believe that part of the bride of Christ got to go through the tribulation. And that ain't going to work. That ain't going to work. The bride of Christ can't go through the tribulation. So the only other explanation is the people that are saved during the tribulation ain't a part of that bride. And they're Jewish converts who must refuse the mark of the beast. And if they take it, it's impossible for them to be renewed again under repentance. Any questions? Because he comes and goes during the tribulation, just like he did in the Old Testament. He he goes he goes in so far as permanently dwelling in their body. See, like he didn't come till Acts chapter two. The Lord said, "If I go away, I'm gonna send him." But he was here throughout the whole Old Testament. He's here, but he ain't here. You know, he's he's here, but he's not circumcising people permanently dwelling in their bodies. And as far as the church, which is his body. Now, did you know the people in the Old Testament say it's a church? But the church, which is his body, is the bride of Christ. A church is a called out assembly. 
There's a church in the book of Acts that was a false church. See? So just because it says church don't mean by Christ. The old uh, church simply means called out assembly, a called out group. So the, per, the if the Holy Ghost leaves at the rapture, he can he bounces around like he did in the Old Testament. He'll come on them, leave, come on them, leave, and they can be a partaker of him. No, I don't think so. Nope. They just have to be a partaker of him, I, I suppose. Now listen, folks, I don't claim to know everything about this. If you if you see where I'm wrong, correct me. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be a smart aleck and say, well, so-and-so, you're a troublemaker and all that. We're here to study the Bible. If I'm wrong, tell me about it. Tell me about it. I'm, I wanna, or just tell me after church. I want to learn. I want to learn. If I'm wrong about something... So I say, well, Brother Danny, uh, you know, I'm not trying to rebuke you or nothing, but, uh, well, this is right. You know, you might help me. The Lord might have showed you something he ain't showed me. Okay, so I'm, I'm just teaching you. There's five different teachings on this, on this scripture. And personally, I think five is the closest one to what the truth teaches, leaving the scripture just like it teaches without messing with it. All right? Mm -hmm. There you go. That's right. That's exactly right. Yep. Yeah. Right. And flaming fire. Mm -hmm. He's going to burn them up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point. That's a real good point. In the context there, the context there is the end of the tribulation whose people will be burned at the end of it. And that, as, as he mentioned, that's no accident. God don't waste no words. The earth with drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it. That's not just an illustration. The big rain flood going to come right there at the end of the tribulation. Then, you know, the sun comes up in the morning and all that kind of stuff. Anybody else? No. Sure don't. You're going to make it. If you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you're going to make it. You're not saved by doing His will. You're saved by trusting what His Son did on the cross. You're saved by believing what That ticket's what's going to get me on that plane tomorrow. You know, not my haircut, my Bible in my arm, not my tie. That ticket is what's going to get me on that plane. And that's what salvation, when you get saved, you get a ticket to heaven. One time I uh, had heard this teaching in number five here that you talked about. Yes, sir. And I just sat down and said, okay, I'm going to call myself a Jew. From what I know about the Old Testament, what I've read in the Gospels, I'm going to sit down and call myself a Jew. I'm going to be in the tribulation. And I just sat down and read the book of Hebrews. Mm. Like it's it just everything just fell in there. Yeah, it I'm does. Like. Try that sometime. Imagine yourself being a Jew in the tribulation and read Hebrews, the whole book. It'll blow your mind. You say, well, if I used to, here's my argument a long time ago. I used to say, well, Hebrews wrote to Hebrews. That means Colossians just wrote to Colossians. No, it don't. Because Colossians are Gentiles, and Ephesians are Gentiles, and Thessalonians are Gentiles. Hebrews are Jews. And God, doctrinally speaking, God, James and, and Hebrews wrote to Hebrews. James said, to the twelve tribes. And that's where a lot of that scripture, it's hard to understand, and James comes in. All right. Also at 414, right there on the same page, the last one thing says, let us hold fast our profession. But we don't do that right now, doctrinally. No. Because we're in Jesus, He's in God. That's right. Ain't no holding to it. That's right. He's holding us. No, He's holding us. That's right. We're in His hand. 
All right, let's let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the Word of God, Lord, and we claim to be students. We don't claim to be scholars, but we're ignorant and unlearned, and we ask you that you'd be our teacher and help us, dear Father, to understand what you want us to understand from the Word of God. We pray that we'd use it for thy glory. Maybe maybe this has helped somebody over a hump in their life, Lord. And God, I pray that the power of the Holy Spirit would open it and illuminate it and be our teacher. God, uh, help us to put in practice what we do know, Lord, and be a faithful witness for Thee in these last days. And God, we pray a special prayer for that meeting up there in New York, beginning tomorrow night. God, I pray that You'd move on those young people. Lord, I feel so inadequate, Lord. They're looking for uh, me to come up there with some uh, great sermon or something like that. Lord, I can't do it. God, I need You. Oh, Lord, if you would be there, Lord, if you would empower me, God, if you'd give me something to say to them, Lord, I pray, God, that that's what would happen, Lord. I don't want to go in my own strength. I, it wouldn't do no good. Be a waste of time and words. Dear Lord, be those services. Convict hearts of sin. Save the, start something up there, Father. May it spread. Start a revival in New York. May the power of God come on the churches, Lord. And, and Lord, let those young people see the power of the Holy Ghost. Lord, move in here Sunday and give everybody here a safe week. And Lord, bless the work out at the camp. And God, meet with us back. And Lord, we ask you to meet with us on our big day on the on the 6th, Lord, of March. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to meet our goal. We pray that people will be saved. We pray that they'll be warned of judgment to come. And we'll praise you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.